So uh, we have a great panel this evening. Uh, we're joined by Francis Stewart, who is one of IDS's own trustees. Uh, Francis um, is the Professor Emeritus of uh, Development Economics at Oxford University and uh, she uh, her, was also from 1993 to 2003 uh, Director of the Centre for Research on Inequality, Human Security and Ethnicity um, and, and many other in incredible things and uh, we're very, very pleased to have her with us um, for this debate. Um, we're also joined, just to, to my right, is um, Lord Jack McConnell. Um, Jack is the longest serving First Minister of Scotland. Not anymore. Not anymore, <laughs> sorry. Right, just going to change that, okay. You can say youngest, well, that'll do. Uh, youngest. <laughs> Best looking. Uh, he served as First Minister from 2001 to 2007. I'm just going to pick a few things out yeah. here because it's quite a, a long list of impressive achievements here. He served as Minister for Education, Europe and External Affairs from 2000 to 2001. Um, he was um, Gordon Brown's uh, Special Representative for Peace Building from 2008 to 2010. And uh, uh, Jack also established Scotland's International Development Policy and signed a, a, a cooperation agreement with Malawi. So uh, he's got uh, some good solid development background. And we're also joined by Ben Jackson, just further to my right. Ben is Chief Executive of Bond, uh, an organisation I'm sure many of you have worked with and are aware of. Bond represents 350 uh, development NGOs uh, based here in the UK. Um, he has 20 years experience uh, in both public and private sector uh, has worked in the UK government in senior communications and policy and campaigning positions. Um, I don't need to introduce Lawrence. You're all here for Lawrence and you know what Lawrence has achieved, so uh, I won't dwell on that now. Oh, you can. <laughs> <laughs> there will be plenty more said about Lawrence later this evening, I promise. So um, we're here to talk about the future of UK aid and the way we've structured this is uh, we have um, a question for each of our panellists. Uh, which we're going to ask them to respond to in around five minutes and then there'll be time for the other panellists to, um, to respond as well. So we're going to start, it's a big subject, so we've, we, we, we've tried to come up with a few questions we thought get right to the core <coughs> of the issues. So I'm going to start with Francis, if that's okay. Um, Francis, we wanted to ask you, in a world where the North and South divide uh, no longer applies and countries such as China, India and Brazil are increasingly important development players. What role do donors from OECD countries like the UK really have in the future? Well, it's a great question. Let me first say that among the things you didn't mention, I was on the board of IFPRI and that's how I met Lawrence and it's a great pleasure to be here, um, although not because he's going, but just to be here in his honour. Wait, am I going? Um, well, in answer to that question, uh, that is the world we're at. Um, when Truman launched the, uh, sort, sort of launched development aid, not really, he said, ended by saying, the old imperialism is dead, which was completely wrong and has continued to be wrong since then. But I think now we have to recognise that it is dead and that we are, in a sense, all in this together, that the world is one. There are the fragile states for which aid applies, but there's a l large number of developing countries for which aid is pretty irrelevant. And I think development policy should not be about aid. It should, there should be real partnership and that we should recognize our shared problems like the volatility of our economies, uh, the vulnerability of our populations, the rising inequality, and above all, the sustainability issues. And when it comes to UK, what policies should we do? Obviously pursue global agreements and all those things, but also look at ourselves and try and stop the bads. For example, the arms trade, for example, corruption by our own companies, um, for example, our own volatility. There are a whole list of things that we do, including, of course, carbon emissions, uh, which are bad for the rest of the world. And I think that our policy should be focused on that now, and that aid is really something in the past. And if I was asked what are the two absolute priorities for the, for the post-2015 era, I would say sustainability, probably the critical issue, and secondly, doing something about inequality. And when I look at uh, all the discussions of which I'm sure everyone in this room has been involved in about what's going to happen post-2015, 
These things are mentioned, but they're not central. They're not in the things that are likely to be monitored. And of course, the reason is they're very political. But I think they are the ones that we should really be worrying about. Thanks, Francis. Um, Lawrence, could I just ask um, you to respond? The world is one, sustainability, inequality. What are your thoughts? Um, I think we're probably going to be agreeing too much on this panel tonight. So let's try and find some reasons to disagree. But um, <laughs> I'm not there yet. I will get there. I, uh, inequality is the big issue I would like to, to focus on. I don't know if, you've, um, if any of you have seen this paper by, well, first of all, seen the paper by Martin Revalian from last year, which basically says, we can get to zero poverty by 2030. Um, the big assumption in that paper is that every country in the world will grow at about five or six percent per year, which has been the average growth rate <coughs> for many countries. However, you can't just apply the average to every country. Not every country is going to grow at that rate, uh, and uh, we'll be lucky if we get the average growth rate. So this, this paper projects, says we're only, we're only going to get to 5% poverty rates, this is extreme poverty, by 2030 if we pay attention to inequality. Even with really quite strong growth rates, 5% on average, 6% on average, we're only going to get to 5% with inequality reduction. And I just don't think that that message has gotten through to the people um, in the aid agencies. Um, I think DFID, you look at, you, you analyze um, the Secretary of State's um, speeches. She says jobs and growth, we're doubling this, the expenditure on jobs and growth in DFID from about 0.75 billion to 1.5 billion. And that's, that's good, but not all jobs reduce poverty, not all growth reduces poverty. Um, the quality of growth really matters, and inequality is a really big part of that. So we're never going to get to Jim Kim's 5% zero poverty. We're never going to get to what the UK government wants, and what we all want, unless we pay serious attention to inequality. Thanks, Lawrence. So, um, Jack, could I ask you, I and mean, this is about the sort of north-south divide breaking down the role of a, a developed country. Is it still relevant? Well, I think the first thing to say is that this is um, we wouldn't be talking about this if it wasn't a critically important time, but this is a, a, almost a one-off opportunity for the global community as a whole to put together a roadmap that covers almost everything that's important. Uh, and now that makes it hard to determine priorities and it makes it hard to get the framework right, but uh, at almost every time when there has been a real change in international relations it's either been a reaction to events, whether that's the end of the Cold War or uh, whatever, or it's been uh, a, an, an ad hoc opportunity like the establishment of the Millennium Development Goals. Uh, and, and therefore what's been agreed has met the challenge of that particular moment. We've seen this coming for a number of years. For once, the world is talking about uh, almost everything at the same time, maybe in different forums, but still uh, uh, discussing climate change, discussing conflict, discussing uh, poverty and inequality, discussing how the North-South partnership works, and so on, all these things all getting discussed at the same time. So I think the opportunity is here to seize that moment, whether we can or not, it's another, uh, another challenge altogether. Um, and I think how we look at this from the North, the Global North, uh, is absolutely critical. And I am still constantly astonished at the relatively patronising attitude that exists uh, in, in most of these discussions from, and not just from politicians, uh, but from lots of people in the development community as well, uh, in discussing uh, what we uh, have as objectives for development uh, and how, that, how, how this can move forward. And I think it's best shown in attitudes to governance and corruption I mean, if I had a pound for every time uh, a, a member of parliament from the UK that fiddled his own expenses had said to me that there's a problem with governance and corruption in Africa, <laughs> um, I'd be better off than a lot of African leaders. And I think, you know, I, I, so I think we need to get a bit of perspective sometimes, a bit of honesty in the debate. The problems that face us are different in their impact around the world, but many of these problems are very, very uh, similar. And I think we need a mindset change. In, uh, in Europe and North America, not just 
uh, warm words about a new partnership and new development players, whether they be um, uh, the big countries like Brazil and China and so on, or whether it be a genuine engagement with smaller countries or poorer countries in sub-Saharan Africa or elsewhere. We need the right words on that, but we also need a mindset change in Europe and North America uh, to this. And that needs to come from the top politicians, but it also needs to be in the development community as well. Um, you know, we do fantastic work in this country through DFID, through the NGOs and through uh, the academic community and so on. Um, but we boast about it too much. We talk about how DFID is the best aid agency in the world and we talk about the British NGOs being the, the, the global leaders and so on. But you know, I think, again, a bit of humility and a bit of perspective is important here. We don't always get it right. Um, and I think until we're willing to admit that, we're not going to get the partnership right that we're looking for. <laughs> Thanks, Jack. So, I mean, Ben, your organisation represents NGOs that <coughs> work internationally, but they're all based in the UK. So, what is your thought on this? Well, um, that very issue is, is definitely one that we're, we're addressing, and that the kind of what, what, what a UK NGO means anymore. And um, <coughs> I'm actually just literally um, this week just advertising for a, something to run off, uh, we're setting up a futures programme, and part of that is to look not uh, to compete with the likes of IDS and others, it's really to think, help our members think through the difficult issues about how they need to change, possibly quite fundamentally, the way they go about doing things and how they work with others to address exactly the issues that Francis was talking about. I, I mean, I, I, of course, like as Lauren said, I agree with much of what the panel was saying, what Francis was saying about, you know, how very different uh, a world we live in. I, I recall um, when I started off as a development campaigner, your, 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 your book on um, adjustment with the human face was a kind of roadmap, literally, for kind of campaigning that we, that we did around that. And if you cast back when we talked about debt crisis, we were talking, I remember also with Stephanie and others talking about, uh, of course, the, the debt owed by, uh, by Latin America or Africa uh, to banks or governments in the, in the West, uh, and the austerity that we were talking about then, and the adjustment was being made, uh, was there. And of course, it's, you know, uh, in many ways, the tables have been completely reversed. The only thing is, I think, that the complicating issue, in a way, is the fact that it's, it's not the, re the, the kind of, the complete reversal, is, you know, the reversal has not been is not complete. I mean, we, we live in this mm -hmm. era of transition in a way, and that's, you know, if, if, if it was true, you mean, you know, we could still go into a village in many parts of Africa, and if you analyse, as I'm sure many of the people in this room do, you know, why are those people poor and disadvantaged? What are the problems there? Many of those issues would be, I think, no different from 10, 20, 30, or 50 years ago, perhaps. Historic opportunity. Um, is there a danger that we arrive in 2016 with no clear global agreement on how to tackle poverty reduction and sustainability? And specifically, what do you see the role of the UK being in trying to mitigate that risk? Uh, well, I think there's, 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 there's always a strong possibility that the world won't, won't agree things. They're pretty good at, pretty good at, pretty good at, uh, at not agreeing things and, and actually has got worse in some ways at agreeing things because... Uh, dysfunctional though, though the old world order was, we knew what it was, and uh, uh, that has broken down. Uh, I mean, I think just very quickly, what are the dangers? Um, uh, I mean, why, why are there those dangers in terms of the work around uh, the kind of what follows the Millennium Development Goals and the broader kind of consensus that could be fashioned out of that? I, I'd say that sort of very quickly, there are sort of you know, perhaps three dangers. One, one in a sense that this becomes too broad, that we try to take on absolutely everything and we say everything about everything and end up with nothing. And I think that is a real danger. And believe me, um, it's, it's, it's even worse that we have 350 members. We have now over 400 members. So I can, I can, I can honestly tell you, trying to, trying to find consensus that is more than mother and apple pie amongst 400 NGOs who are also, at the same time, lecturing governments about getting their act together is no easy matter. <laughs> so I think there is an issue about that question of prioritisation, and there's a danger of that. And, and then perhaps, kind of conversely, there's also an issue, a danger that uh, we don't succeed because we are, we are too limited. We work strongly. I mean, I've got a lot of time for what the development goals did achieve, but that we work only with that narrative, and we kind of end up with a kind of Millennium Development Goals Plus. And for all the reasons that Francis and others have touched on, that just is not going to work. It, it, you know, it is not. We need to broaden. Uh, we need to kind of uh, uh, rethink the framework. The issues around sustainability and development, about rights and accountability, all those issues do need somehow to be incorporated. And most crucially, 
there needs to be this greater approach to universality, that, that it is something that is a set of goals that everyone can own. Of course, in some countries and in some context, it will apply more because the gap uh, will be greater, but they will be universal goals. So I think there's, there's those two changes of, in a sense, being trying to be too broad, but also uh, too limited. And I think the other piece is, is this point about transition. You know, how, how do we fashion those that are going to be relevant for kind of this crucial next 15 years that are, that are kind of consistent with the past uh, and that carry those, particularly the poorer developing countries, who, who do feel uh, already in the negotiations, they feel that, well, it's all very well for Brazil or for others to say, well, we, you know, we don't care about it anymore and what have you. Um, uh, of course, that is changing, but that is you know, not the case necessarily for all developing countries. So it needs to be fashioned. There is a danger that we don't quite place it right in terms of <coughs> consistency with that uh, ongoing development uh, kind of uh, challenge, uh, but also is future... Uh, future fit, and I suppose the question is, and many some of my my NGO members asked this as a very good question. You know, does it matter? I mean, we spend so much time already talking about the post 2015 goals. It's kind of thinking that we're going to spend all this time and possibly end up with some decent goals, but you know. Uh, does it matter? I think it does matter because for all the reasons I just touched on about needing a new narrative, needing a new roadmap and a consensus that makes sense for the coming period rather from, from the past. So I think what we, we need in brief um, are uh, a set of goals that are bold and actually inspired action. You know, whatever one can debate about the Millennium Development Goals and there are you know, good points and bad points. They were something, unlike so many other UN initiatives and others, which kind of were made and left on a shelf, that actually did inspire political action, that were taken up, that were pointed to, and did drive action, uh, and have driven action. I think that's, uh, I'm not saying the formula is the same, but we need to achieve that. I think we still need to hold on to the point about them being actionable and specific. Uh, and again, that's very much something I keep saying to NGOs, you know, there's a big, big sort of aspirations, broad aspirations. How as a government, how as a regional bloc can I actually implement this? And that is crucial that they need to be fashioned that way. And the final point is, if, then, if we're to avoid this danger, is that we need to, it to engage in a grown-up way and as a priority issue, not just in the kind of development goals and outcomes, but the crucial issue, I'm afraid, of resourcing and political will. Because unless we ad address that issue early and as, as importantly, um, it will be completely undermined. It will be there in the background. Of course it will. It always is the question of money, basically. And who pays? What pays? We need more inventive, innovative approaches to this in terms of private sector, public sector, in terms of traditional donors, new donors, new powers and others. We do need to think that through. But unless we're thinking about that now, that the idea, you know, here is the shopping list, and oh, let's just kind of at the end of the process think about that. That, that will not work, and it will be doomed to failure as a result. So I think those are the issues we need to grapple with to avoid failure. Thanks. Uh, Jack, how do we avoid a dance squid in 2016? Well, um, I'm going to disagree with the question, if that's, uh, if that's all right. Long said he wanted a bit of disagreement. Um, and uh, I mean, I, I don't think there will be a global agreement next year if it doesn't include something uh, fairly strong on both poverty and sustainability. I, I don't think it's possible to get a global agreement uh, without that. Um, uh, whether it will be enough is another issue altogether, but it will, uh, I, I think whatever is agreed next year will be is, is unlikely to, 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 uh, to avoid those topics and, to, and will contain you know, uh, uh, progress on, on, on both and they'll be integrated into the, uh, into the framework. Um, I think there's a much more serious issue and that is that uh, the, the real political challenge uh, uh, in some ways maybe a diplomatic challenge internationally for the next 18 months is how can we make sure that uh, the scale of the problems facing uh, those living with conflict or the aftermath of conflict is reflected in this uh, global agreement uh, by far and away the poorest countries in the world, the poorest people in the world the people most vulnerable in the world live in uh, states or communities that have been affected by uh, conflict and sustained violence and unless this new global agreement addresses that issue, as perhaps for the first time ever last year it started to do so, uh, unless it addresses that issue and the kind of institutions, rule of law, human rights framework that will protect people and allow for development in those communities and in those countries, then uh, we may well make further progress over the next 15 years, but we will certainly not get close to ending extreme poverty, because extreme poverty will continue to exist 
in areas that are affected by conflict or that have been recently affected by sustained violence. So I think, um, yes, poverty and sustainability are central to this, but I feel much more optimistic about those two areas of policy um, than about uh, conflict and uh, peace building. And I think the real international pressure needs to be on those, particularly on those few influential um, states who do not want to see issues of conflict uh, and peace building reflected in the final framework. And we need global action to try and pressurise them to make sure that they agree it. Thanks. Um, Lawrence, what are your thoughts? Thanks, James. Um, I think I'm, not, I'm an optimist about this, uh, about the global goals, actually, uh, although it does depend on which six months period you ask me the question. <laughs> I, um, in 2013 and 2012, I just got so jaded by the whole post-2015 discussion, uh, I couldn't wait for 2016 to happen. <laughs> but um, I'm quite optimistic that there will be a set of goals. Uh, why is that? I think the Battle of the Power got us off to a good start. Um, not perfect, but a good start. And I just think the sheer embarrassment of senior politicians um, in 2015 in New York in September holding up a, a really limp set of goals, I just think that won't happen. I think there will be too much pressure from civil society. The MDGs kind of slipped in under the wire, but they've been moderately successful, I think, and that's why there's so much riding on this set of goals. So I think there will be a set of goals. I think there'll be some very difficult issues to deal with, though. I think the universal universality try getting the US to agree to any set of, any indicator or any goal that they actually have to apply to, because this is, the next set of goals isn't going to be about, we've got the solutions, you've got the problems. It's going to be, we've all, we all have to deal with these common problems, the collective action problems, and actually some of us in the richer countries have exactly the same types of problems that the middle and low income countries do. They have different manifestations, but similar root causes. So I think the universality is going to be a big battle I think getting sustainability in in a meaningful way is going to be a big battle. I think the high-level panel didn't really do that. They kind of they kind of slipped it in under the twelve uh, goals. I didn't think they really embedded it within within the goals properly. And I think the other big battle is going to be about not just having the goals being outcomes, but actually getting some commitments into the goals. So let's track things that governments can control and can commit to. So. You can't, governments can't completely control whether hunger goes down in their country or not. They can have something to do with that. There are loads of other factors. So when things improve, they can claim the credit. When things are bad, they can say, well, it wasn't our fault, there was something else happening. But if you build in some commitment indicators, how much do you spend? Are your policies the right policies? Are, are you signing up to the right international agreements? Um, do, you have, do you have the right um, institutional setups to do these things? I think that's also going to be a very big battle. So I think there will be an agreement. I think there will be three difficult things um, to battle over at least. Um, but I think the battles won't be around the goals. I think there'll be quite a good consensus on what the goals will be. I think there'll be more of a battle around the indicators and the big battles will come around the targets. And, and different countries will have different targets and that's probably where we'll end up with the, with the big fight will be what target does this country have and what target does that country have? If we have targets at all by 2016, we may not. We may have the goals and the indicators from other targets. So I'm, I'm moderately optimistic we'll have some. I'm moderately optimistic they'll be quite, quite good. They will deal with some of these issues, but the specificity, I can't see it happening by, by September 2015. Thanks, Lawrence. Francis, are you feeling optimistic? Well, I mean, it depends on what. Yes, we'll make some agreement on goals, and even on targets, um, and we know the sort of character of them, but will they actually deliver in terms of the real problems that I was mentioning? And we know on car carbon emissions, we've had a series of failed agreements, or non-agreements. Um, on inequalities, people haven't even begun to think about sort of policies progressive taxation, land redistribution. I mean, in this, this government in our country is sort of reducing the pro progressivity of the taxation, talking about uh, reducing inheritance tax and so on, and that's happening everywhere. Are we going to tackle global capitalism, to put it briefly, which is the driver <laughs> of both emissions and inequality? So we'll have agreement on, yes, we'll have an agreement on the targets and the indicators and things. And I'm not saying that's bad. I mean, it's better than not having agreement. And it does push things you know, in the right direction. 
but I don't think we'll tackle the major issues. And I sometimes think that the global, the idea of global negotiations and global agreements is actually an enemy of progress in the very difficult areas because it discourages people from taking national and local and regional action. And really, I think there's more hope in these areas for it to start by national and regional action, and even local action. For example, some of the states in the United States are doing great things on carbon emissions, and they're leading the way. And if they were going to say, no, let's wait for an agreement just in the US, let alone a global agreement, nothing would happen. So, yeah, I, I hope that we can pursue our objectives, not just through these goals, which are diverting everyone's attention, and I mean, I think we should have them because it would be terrible failure of the world not to I hope we can pursue the other things in a more realistic way. Thank you so much. So, we're going to move on a little bit away from goals, you'll be pleased to hear. Um, Jack, I've got a question for you, you've tried to be a bit political. Um, so, um, with the rise of UKIP, uh, and growing aid scepticism in the media, um, what will a, a new government after a general election here in the UK need to do to build and maintain public support for UK aid and development policy? Hmm. Um, <laughs> that's an easy question. Yeah. I think we're in, a, we're in quite an unusual position really, I think. Um, very rarely has there been a situation uh, as we have in this country at the moment where there's a pretty much a broad consensus, among, certainly amongst the elected politicians. I know that there are those on the fringes that might take a different approach, but amongst the elected politicians, mainstream parties, leaderships, uh, about the importance of uh, uh, international development uh, to the UK. Um, but that the public not always in agreement with that anymore. It's kind of the other way around. Uh, you know, we used to, used to be in a situation where the public were trying to pressurise the political parties to take this issue more seriously. And we're almost now in a situation where we're talking to political parties about how they can get the public to be a bit more uh, supportive of what they're doing. Um, it doesn't normally work like that. Um, so I think this is quite a challenging situation. I, 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 uh, I think one of the keys, um, again, to try and not just say the obvious thing, but maybe say something a bit more uh, uh, provocative or controversial. I mean, I think one of, the, one of the issues, it seems to me, is that we are not very good at talking about the successes in development. Um, and when we have got successes in development, we're very good at shooting them down. Um, I don't know if anybody saw Newsnight last night talking about Rwanda, but I'll just use that as an example. Uh, you know, because Rwanda has been successful in development, um, and to some extent in conflict resolution certainly within their own borders you know, issues, issues obviously in the DRC next door um, then you know, they become a target for people in Europe, the UK, elsewhere both in the NGO community and amongst politicians uh, 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 to be knocked down rather than actually tell people that the money both in development aid, but also inside the country, the institution building and the uh, and the development of new structures post conflict <coughs> has actually made a difference to people's lives there. Um, and this is what we do, you know. We instead of actually celebrating uh, uh, in, in, a, in, a real, in a measured way, in a proper way, with some perspective, but at least talking about uh, success uh, and therefore convincing people that it was a good idea to invest in that country and its people and help them in that situation where they were, they were coming out of conflict, we shoot them down. Um, and, uh, and therefore we create a level of cynicism uh, that, 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 uh, that, that leads to government decisions in this country to break the partnership with them um, and at 24 hours notice take a big whack out of their budget and lead to them closing schools and, uh, and medical centres. Um, so I just think uh, while there appears to be a cosy political consensus in this country at the moment and a problem with public opinion, some of that problem uh, with public opinion has been created by politicians and others not leading properly. And I think politicians, so if, if you're asking me what your politicians need to do to secure the kind of public support that there was for development aid in this country back in 2005, uh, and the kind of understanding about international <coughs> justice that there was back then as well. 
because that you know, we have to remember the 2005 campaign started the justice campaign around about the millennium. Um, then I think a part of that is about political leaders in the UK and all parties being a bit more honest, but also telling people about the progress that has been made. Because I think public cynicism is largely um, being uh, created by a feeling that y UK money uh, is being spent unwisely. I don't, think, I don't think the British public's got a problem with us contributing to international development and the global partnership. I think they've got a problem because they think that the money has not been spent properly. And that is not the case in the majority of instances. And I think British politicians need to be a bit more brave in telling people that it is, in most cases, making a real difference to people's lives. Um, and Ben, I mean, your members are pretty good at getting money out of the general public, so is there any tips they can give to the next government about you know, this narrative around the uh, They are, although um, uh, I keep being told that it's getting tougher and harder to do it, and more expensive to do it. I mean, I completely um, agree with much of what Jack, Jack was saying. I mean, I, I actually think it's, it's a massive issue, and one we are trying to address with our members around... Uh, making the case and remaking that case, I think that um, it's a sort of a slight irony that, um, again, go, going back a bit, the idea that the Daily Mail would carry any story to do with aid or development on its front page, you know, 10, 15 years ago was just laughable. They just would not, it was not seen as a serious issue, it was not seen as, as, as sort of something that was kind of in the mainstream of, of, of politics. And so in that sense, um, although we in the sort of development community, when uh, you read front page stories saying, sign our petition to say we should divert aid from, uh, from the aid program to um, needy people in floods in Somerset, uh, it's kind of alarming and it's quite, it's quite, we're not used to it. I mean, it's a kind of hostility and a kind of, uh, kind of toughness that we're, we're not used to. To me, actually, in a sense, um, in one sense, it's a sign of the kind of maturing of the issues because it's become another issue which, of course, simplistically and ridiculously, issues are knocked around about, but they are knocked around about. I think our failure, and I do think it's a failure, is that we're not getting out back out on the front foot to engage with that and remake that case. We tend to either dismiss or laugh at that, and of course, they are very simplistic mm -hmm. arguments, but, you know, I think it's an argument we have to remake. Yeah, what, why... You know, why, I mean, it, of course, much of it, and I agree with Francis, that it shouldn't all just be through the lens of AIDS. A lot of it is done through the lens of AIDS, but unfortunately that's how the narrative is. You know, it's, it's, of course, it's a simplistic argument to say that, uh, you know, India's got a space program, ergo, you know, there should be no aid or development engagement. But in a sense, something lies behind that. And we've just forgotten. We have, we have moved. We, we don't get out there in the drafty, the you know, church halls and the cyber equivalents of those really to make the basic case. So, for, and, and that's actually something we've been doing some research and looking at public attitudes to development. And when you analyse that, not just in terms of quantitative data, but you, you, you kind of dig into why people do that, they are extremely confused. And part of that, I think, is to do with fundraising. You know, they hear a hundred different messages about different um, mm -hmm. stuff. Uh, they believe that um, most of our contact with Africa is uh, through you know, my members, which is uh, quite alarming. They know nothing about government aid. They are uh, up to utterly obsessed about corruption, not to say that corruption is not a problem, but, I mean, that's, that's a good example, is the corruption issue. You talk to people, and that will be front and centre of many people's consciousness about this issue, and, of course, corruption exists, and it's a problem. It's something we very rarely talk about as a community and address. And somehow we are slightly sort of scathing or look down on people for saying, and of course, you know, very simplistic no notions about that, but the answer to that is not to, up, not to ignore that. So my, my first thing is that I think there is a danger that we're not making that case. And I think the second thing is how we make that case. And Jeff and I were just talking before we started about the fact that, in a sense, development, there is this consensus that there never used to be. We used to fight the battles about um, aid and development being misused for trade and this, that and the other. In a sense, there is this consensus around, yes, of course it should be focused, the issue is poverty reduction. But in a way, that's taken us onto a quite a narrow kind of, I mean, you know, a, a kind of one area. What we don't do is connect the arguments that there used to be around why development in its broadest sense is a good thing globally. Why is it, why is it part of, you know, the world we need to live in? Why is it more important 
uh, in a sense than it's ever been because we live in a globalised world. So I, I think uh, we will see in the European elections coming up, not just around Europe, it's not just an issue about sort of anti-Europeanism, it's a kind of turning inward, it's a forgetting of why it matters that we are connected with the rest of the world, including poorer parts of the world and the issues of development. So I think we need to get out there and remake the case, all of us who are part of this community. Uh, we need to invest in that, we need to think about that, and I think we also need to think about the breadth of the case, that, that development must not sit alone from our wider international engagement. And that's quite scary. When I talk to my members about that, it's like, oh, well, that gets into foreign affairs, and you know, it all becomes instrumentalizing aid, and blah, 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 blah. And I, I hear that point, but I don't think the, that is not the answer. We need to re-examine those, those, those sort of arguments as to why uh, development you know, matters for the global commons and for, for all of us and the future of all of us and our children, uh, <coughs> not just you know, some people over there uh, that are at the receiving end. Um, Lawrence, does the, does the development research community have a role to play here in terms of this narrative and public scepticism? Thanks, James. Um, I'm an economist, so I like to boil things down into... Um, well, boil them down to manageable pieces. Right? My non-economist mad. My non-economist non colleagues mad. So I divide this up into four types of people. Right? There's the people who think no matter what we spend aid on, it always works and it's brilliant. So they're the religious fanatics about aid. I don't think there are too many of those in this room, but maybe maybe a few. Then there's the group that says, if it works, show me it works, and I show me it works over there or wherever you're spending it, and I'm for it. Then there's the group that says, show me it works for us in the UK, then I'll support it. Then there's the group who just, no matter what you show them, they just think, even if it works for us over here, it should be spent on flood protection in the Somerset levels. Right? Um, so for that, th those two middle groups, I think for the first group, show me that it works where it's being spent. I think we're getting better as a research community in figuring out what works, what doesn't work, why it works, how it works, when it won't work somewhere else. Um, we're getting better at that. Where I think we really fail is to say it, it, we should spend money in Malawi or Zimbabwe or Zambia because it's good for us here. I felt so sorry for poor Eric Pickles, and I don't feel sorry for him very often. But he, he made a coin, he's the Minister for uh, Communities, right? Uh, local communities, and he was, uh, I guess Ed Davey was uh, away or somewhere, and he had to make a comment about the, the flooding in the, in the south of England, and he said, it's good, we're doing good things overseas on climate mitigation, and that's good for the for flooding in the UK, and I just felt like, man, you're on a, you're on a loser there, <laughs> I can't believe you said that. Um, but, but, you know, we, that may be a stretch too far, but there is some evidence we could, we could try and think about how do you make the case that it's actually benefits, there are feedback benefits for this people here. For the, the first group, the religious group, the, the evangelicals, I think we need to, I think they're actually a very dangerous group, and they need to be much more humble and much more um, judicious about what works and what doesn't work. And we need, and sometimes we're part of that group, and we need to be much clearer about and more honest and transparent about things that don't work and about failures and risks. And why would we expect every aid project to work when half of all businesses in the UK fail? Why would we expect that? And I, I, that's the kind of yep. dialogue I'd like to have our, our politicians to yep. have. That kind of honor. And we, us as well. The last group, uh, Simon and I always have discussions about the last group. How do you get, how do you change people's minds when there's massive cognitive dissonance? They don't believe any piece of evidence that you, have, you can throw at them. Um, you know, some of the work that Spencer Henson and others did uh, around the UK uh, public opinion monitoring is quite interesting. They will give you clues about, actually, it's when a, an aid skeptic's daughter goes on a gap year, or when um, they have a, a, a lodger come and stay with them from Sudan, or you know, when, when they go on a trip somewhere. Um, it's those kinds of emotional, Left, feet, left field, left of center things, those kind of connections happen. I don't think you can do much to make them more likely to happen or not. But, so I think we need to do a much better job of, of marshalling the evidence, yes, but that only works for a certain group of people. We need to do a much better job of engaging on the evidence, and that's not just the politicians, it's us as well. Have you ever sat next to somebody and said, what do you do? And they, did, they didn't know anything about development. Have you ever tried to have that conversation with them? <laughs> um, it's not easy. It's not easy, but we, we have to do that. We have to convince people one, one person at a time, it seems to me. That's good. 
Thanks, Lawrence. Francis, do you make that contribution? Yes, I, yeah, well, on the, directly on the issue, I think that we could do much more in the schools than we do this. And I certainly became an internationalist by joining something called Q, Council for Education of World Citizenship, and I don't believe that that is very, uh, you know, prevalent anymore. And so I think the whole curriculum and so on could be much more uh, global, and maybe these exchanges could be systematized that Lawrence talked about. But I think more broadly, it is difficult to ask people, when you're in a, in a country in which poverty at home is being worsened, it's very difficult to ask people, say, all right, you can't have your, extra, your, your room for your child because you, you, know, you have to move house, you have to move school because of our new housing policy, and you can't have this, you can't have that. And then say, but of course, we are going to give all this money overseas. I think that's a very difficult thing to sell. I mean, and so I think you need to tackle both at the same time and not just say, how do we support aid, but we don't care what happens domestically. But I'd also like to revert a little bit to what I was saying before, that there's a lot of world which isn't aid. <coughs> Remittances are far bigger than aid. Uh, now, the country's not too keen on immigration either, but um, that is an area where, you know, if you stop that, those remittances, you do much worse than if you, if you stop the aid. Um, if, you ta if the uh, developing countries got the tax that they're owed from multinational corporations, that is equivalent to aid. So I think we should work on those fronts. We shouldn't just say, well, it's just aid, and much better for countries to earn their own money and to spend it themselves uh, rather than for us to be getting it. <coughs> so we should work on those fronts too. Yeah. Thanks, Francis. Lawrence, do you want to well, Just on how, and how can you use aid to maximise those domestic resource prices as well? But I, I, I'd like, I haven't seen anyone write this book, and they, they need to. Maybe they, have, maybe they have, and I haven't read it, but is the UK aid too high? And I'd, I'd really like to see somebody write a blog like that. Uh, I think we all assume it's not high enough, or it's just about right, because it's a 0 0.7 or getting there. But I wonder sometimes whether it's too high. Uh, maybe that we can... Maybe we can have some discussion of that with the, with the audience. Okay, uh, so last question. <laughs> we will be opening up to the audience later, so don't worry. I, Jack asked me earlier, are we going to ask the audience any questions? I said, no, no. I just saw in my notes so later it says, yeah, chair will invite the audience. <laughs> this is what happens when you stand in this chair. So, um, final question though for the panel, um, and this one is for Lawrence, um, and it brings us back in a way to where we started around a changing world. Lawrence, how do you think UK development and aid policy will need to change to respond to a more complex world post-2015? Okay, so when I got this exam question, I thought I had 10 minutes to answer it, and so I realized about three minutes to answer it. I really need to read my emails properly. <laughs> so my, 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 four, my four points are in three minutes. Um, more and more of the problems is that we're, we're facing our collective action problems. It seems to be climate, tax, trade, um, firearms, conflict, drugs, lots of, lots of these things are collective action problems. And it seems to me that the more and more narrow DFID gets in terms of its bilateral program, the harder and harder it is for it to, it to contribute to these collective action problems. Now, um, again, um, Ed Davey got into a massive problem with Justine Greening because he spent 15 million pounds uh, of DEX money on, um, what, what was it? Cow, cow flatulence prevention in Colombia. I think that was what it was. And that may be a very sensible thing to do, I don't know. But it doesn't actually play very well uh, in the UK public. So I think, so what's the answer? The answer is work your multilateral routes, invest in your multilaterals. Your, your multilateral aid review should give you some confidence in, in some of the multilaterals. So spend money on that. Um, the other, the other thing that um, DFID could do is think about alternative multilateral mechanisms. So I work a lot on nutrition and the scaling up nutrition movement is a movement of countries, the UN agency and civil society. Uh, it's got 50 countries as members now and it's a very powerful collective action movement. Nutrition reduction doesn't require collective action but there's a lot of learning and solidarity and all sorts of stuff happening momentum is building in. And DFID has been a big supporter of that. And uh, I'd like to see more of that. Second point, uh, working in fragile contexts, um, my colleagues Jeremy Aleutian and Jeremy uh, Lynn did a really nice piece of analysis on this um, 
on, on what, what are the lessons for DFID of working in fragile contexts. And they come up with some actually very um, practical and very, um, in, in one way, it's very unglamorous conclusions. Um, have more people in the places that are fragile, because fragile contexts, typically history matters hugely. It matters everywhere, but it matters hugely there. Um, the politics are incredibly complicated, incredibly dynamic, and the consequences of getting it wrong are catastrophic. So have people in the places you're working. Make sure, that's number one. Two, make sure they don't move every two or three years, which is pretty typical. And three, make sure they actually have the skills across the range of diplomacy, defense, development, you name it. And I think this is a really big challenge for DFID because it's, because it's structurally uh, disconnected from the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. Um, many, uh, many other aid agencies are moving the other direction. AusAid is now called WasAid, right, in Australia, <laughs> because it's, it's, it's now moved into the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Same with Canada, we don't have CEDA anymore. Um, but I, think, I don't think that's going to happen with DFID for a while, actually. So that makes it all the more imperative that DFID tries to overcome those structural uh, disconnects with FCO and others. A third point is, I've mentioned this already, working in the so-called IDA graduates, the so-called um, development assistance graduates, the countries that are above, as it, about $1,100 GDP per capita. And, you know, 70%, as Andy Sumner's work has shown, 70% of the world's poverty is in those so-called middle and low-income countries. Those countries have graduated out of, po out of, out of low-income status, but they've left their populations behind. Their populations are still poor. What to do in those countries? And I come back to the point about inequality. Um, <coughs> you have to work with the, with the national governments that want to work with you, obviously, and you have to figure out what to do about inequality, because it's the only way growth is going to reduce poverty is if you pay attention to inequality. My fourth point about what, what I think the UK government and the UK aid program needs to do to ensure it can operate effectively in a post-2015 world is um, get a better balance of um, accountability and flexibility. I don't know a single person, and if there is a single person in this room, who thinks it's easier to work with DFID now than it was three years ago, please put your hand up. Um, because I don't think, I haven't met a single person who thinks that. Now, we know that DFID is under intense pressure to make sure its work is, has demonstrates value for money. And we all want that. We all want. I'm a UK taxpayer. I want DFID to, to exhibit value for money. Um, the problem is the money bit is much easier to, to see and monitor than the value bit. Um, so you'll get into situations, and it's happened to me, it's happened to, I imagine, lots of you, where you go into a room and you'll say, you go into some dark room in, in Diffid, well, it's usually lit, actually, but it's usually windowless, and they say, you've won the contract, we think you have the best proposal uh, on the technical and on the cost, but now can you just reduce the budget by 5 to 10%? Why? Well, because we have to show the minister value for money, and money is the easier bit to show rather than value. And I think, I think it's a real shame, because I think it's, it's stopping and people in DFID, and if there are any DFID colleagues in the audience, I'm not going to apologize, I'm going to sympathize with you, because I think you have to deal with a really difficult situation. I'm looking at two uh, chief economists, former chief economists from DFID, staring me in the face. Um, I think it's really difficult, but I think somehow we've got to, if, if DFID really is going to become a procurement agency, then it has to do procurement better. And that was the conclusion of the, um, the Independent Commission on, on aid effectiveness, one of their last reports on, on procurement. Uh, DFID has to do procurement better. I know it sounds really pedantic and really boring, <coughs> but if they don't do procurement better, it's only the really big agencies and the really big private sector companies that are going to be able to manage the nonsense, the transaction costs of dealing with DFID. And I don't think that's where the really exciting, innovative ideas come from. I think. Uh, a lot of them come from the small or the medium-sized organizations that think a little bit left field or right field or center field. Um, so I think it's a real problem, and I, that's my fourth point. Thanks, Lawrence. Um, ben, what do you think needs to change? Uh, well, agree agree with many of those points. Um, I certainly think that the point around, um, I mean, the point around DFID <coughs> doing more than aid, and I think 
the, the vision actually when you know and I've been part of those conversations and, and battles to to make the case that um, uh, um, ODA as well as part of the Asian Foreign Office should be broken off and should be a separate ministry and, and part of that was to be driven by a more development agenda and I think you know I think actually that's not the only reason but I think it has been much more successful when you look back to the old days of the A-Trade provision and you know winning contracts for Balfour BT and all that kind of stuff um, but I think the other piece was around it being a development ministry and being a voice in government and internationally on all those other issues apart from just managing aid and I think it you know, it did do some of that. It did realise some of that, but I think it's retrenched from that. And I think that's, uh, and I think it's also, you know, I think the NGOs share some of that blame. We do a lot less work on those issues and push on a lot less, less of those issues. I mean, there's you know very little work on trade issues and all those sort of things as well. So I think there is definitely a piece around, uh, particularly as um, you know, uh, as you rightly point out. Uh, there has been growth, and there has been uh, economic growth in, in many developing countries. Um, the issue really hones in us, how does that growth uh, drive, um, you know, uh, lowering of inequality and reduction of poverty, and there's some, you know, real possibilities of making some inroads there. Um, so I think it needs to do a lot, a, a lot more on that. I think the other piece is, is thinking about accountability, not, not in the sense of to the taxpayer or to the Daily Mail or everybody else, um, but accountability, you know, investing in, uh, again, particularly those those countries, maybe you're talking about, uh, well, all countries, but in, 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 in perhaps in the more, uh, those who have grown more recently, in the forces for accountability. And I do think this is where, and it's not as simple as just in the NGOs, but I think there's a whole piece around how do we help equip and support uh, capacity so that there is... Um, uh, a kind of uh, a natural pressure, a kind of help those who are trying to make the case within their own countries at a national level and regionally uh, for better distribution of resources and so on. And actually, well, uh, well invested and well resourced. It's not saying Diffie doesn't do any of this, but I think that that, that could be extremely good value for money. Hard to, I don't know how you do, I don't know how you do the kind of uh, the kind of test to show that, but actually that sort of investment for making the case for tax accountability, uh, for how resources are being paid, for uh, not just aid resources but national resources as well I think is hugely important and, and valuable and would be another area where I think we you could do more creative and innovative work in this uh, and invest in that in a more serious way um, and as I say not just ju not just through the NGOs it's not a sort of self-interested argument I think there's many many other ways so I, th I think um, I'm not going to our list but I think those are a couple of areas where we could and should should do more um, uh, through through different uh, programs thanks Jack you want to contribute? Um, yes, four quick C's. Um, number one, conflict, uh, where I think the, uh, the, the new government in 2010 um, very helpfully, I think, uh, gave much more of a focus to UK development policy on uh, conflict affected states in a way that uh, wasn't really happening before. Andrew Mitchell was very clear on that. Um, although we're in different parties, I uh, fully supported his uh, uh, approach to prioritising uh, conflict-affected states. I think we need to go even further post-2015 in uh, entrenching that prioritisation and making a difference in those, uh, uh, in, in those countries. Um, I'm not sure that the percentage target figure really translated into a whole department approach um, and really seeing how the UK could maximise its impact um, in, uh, in those countries beyond sort of headline conflict affected states. Secondly, I think on coordination, I, I, I agree um, uh, with uh, Lawrence's point about that. Uh, again, I think the new government made the right decision in setting up the National Security Council, uh, something that the Labour government should have done, didn't do, uh, a good move in the right direction. I was shocked when I was in, uh, in the FCO between 2008 and 2010 as Special Rep for Peace Building, I went into the position assuming that the Ministry of Defence would be the hardest department to work with, the FCO would be the next hardest department to work with, and Diffin would be the easiest department to work with when trying to get coordination of policy and effect on peace building. And uh, I have to say that consistently, the people who were most reluctant to turn up to the meetings that I was calling were those from DFID. Uh, it was a struggle, uh, and I think, uh, I think there is an issue 
about the integration of DFID with the rest of government in the UK um, and, a, and a kind of opening up of uh, a less defensive approach uh, to their role within the overall government machine and internationally, I think we need to, uh, you know, look again at the issue of, uh, you know, separate buildings, separate operations uh, in, in many parts of the world. I think there's a need to, to tackle that issue. We are not in 1995. We do not have uh, problems of the transparency of ODA and so on that existed back then. It's perfectly possible for a better integration of UK foreign policy. Uh, 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 without, uh, without threatening the integrity of the way that we spend our, our development uh, uh, money overseas. The third area I would say is capacity. Um, <coughs> some of the best work the UK has done internationally has been, for example, in places like Rwanda and Burundi to help create revenue authorities that allow those countries to, to build their own finances uh, uh, and, uh, and move towards a more independent uh, status. I think we should do much more of that, uh, not just the UK but many other countries with developed systems of revenue collection, for example, but also parliamentary uh, scrutiny and transparency as well. I think we could do much more to assist countries that want that assistance and are struggling to cope with the demands uh, of development in ways that um, sometimes I don't think we understand uh, properly. There's a willingness to change, and I think we could provide much more assistance on that. And the final thing, the final C would be China. Um, and I think, I, I think sometimes we see, for, for example, Chinese engagement across Africa uh, in far too simplistic terms. A lot of what is happening uh, in, in Chinese engagement in parts of Africa uh, is happening uh, for reasons that are not about deliberate manipulation um, by the Chinese government of resources and international uh, power relationships and so on but they're happening because of the way the Chinese department operate, Chinese government operates departmentally uh, in its relationships overseas, happening because of naivety in development, the relationship between the Chinese government, Chinese companies, and so on. And I think we could do much more at the moment to assist China to be better <coughs> at its international engagement in the developing world, but perhaps through that process also help others whose engagement is going to grow in the future. So we, I don't think we should feel as threatened as we do by that engagement, we should be engaging with them to help them engage better. Thanks, Jack. Um, Francis, can I give you the final word? Yes, sure. Well, I agree with more or less everything that's been said, but I think that um, in the new world, we are going to be concentrating our aid much more, and I think that's good. And we're going to be concentrating on low-income countries, clearly. And, uh, and these countries are also generally fragile. In other words, they have a high propensity to fall into conflict. And this, this is a hobby horse I've been arguing with Diffie for a long, long time. But I think that our policy towards low-income countries, the whole nature of our development policy should take into account this potential fragility and the root causes of violence. And I think it doesn't. I think that we tend to follow the same sort of policies as we follow elsewhere, and we don't worry about what in, um, I, I think that inequalities are a huge factor, horizontal inequalities behind conflict, and we don't address them in most of our conflict policy. I mean, recently I've been to Liberia, and Liberia is doing quite well in a way. It's a post-conflict country. It looks as if it's doing well, but actually the inequalities are increasing. The uh, certain groups are gaining, and they're gaining politically, and they're gaining economically. I have to say I think the same thing's happening in Rwanda. I think Rwanda is a bit of a danger case. It looks good at the moment, but I think there's a lot of uh, a lot of danger underlying it, and that we should be, in all our development policy, thinking about: is this going to make the situation more sustainable? Is it going to make it uh, less fragile, or is it not? As well as the normal sort of development issues. So I think that's where I would like to put to change in the post 2016 world. Rather than delay the drinks and presentation, which would be very exciting, I was asked. Uh, each panellist to just um, help sum up this uh, great debate um, by each uh, telling us what their kind of takeaway point is from this evening on the future of UK aid and development. 30 seconds each, please, <laughs> if you can. Imagine you're stuck in an elevator for 30 seconds and you've got to uh, describe to somebody uh, who you're trapped in the elevator with what the best thing was about this discussion. I'm going to, I'm going to start with Ben, please. Um, 
Well, I think what I take away is that the, is the world is changing. There are some things that are staying the same, but many things that are changing. And in order to do that, I think we all need to work together, both the academic and research community, civil society, people in, uh, of goodwill in, in government and, and, and politics, because that, that is needed to solve, solve the problem. And I think um, I, I can take that opportunity to, to segue very briefly to say I think that's, that's also... Uh, you know much of what Lawrence has, has shown in his leadership at IDS and, I, and where I've come into contact with him, for example, last year around the G8 and the Nutrition Summit, that actually the application of um, you know uh, very you know uh, rigorous thinking, evidence, using evidence, and we need evidence uh, like never before as to how we solve these problems, but also a passion and a humanity. Um, so make, being able to take all that, but also in different forum make that case so um, we need a lot more of that I think Lawrence has displayed that and um, and also sums up what's best about IDS so um, I um, kind of say that we, we need more of that and um, thank you to Lawrence for, for showing us that over the, over the recent period at IDS. Thanks Ben. Jack? Yeah massive thanks to Lawrence. Uh, uh, I delayed my return to Scotland for the weekend by 24 hours to, to be here, uh, I, and because I wanted to say that, and uh, I, I don't want to leave without saying it, uh, great leadership and uh, uh, continued development of IDS, and I hope that, uh, I'm sure that Melissa will take that forward from the, uh, in, 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 the, in the years to come. Um, the, the, the thing I take away from this is that we need more of this. Um, you know, I am pretty concerned, that's what we're talking about. Before, before the, the Ben and I were talking about before, before we started tonight, I am really pretty concerned. I think there's a uh, there's a decline in interest in international uh, issues and really in, in affairs uh, amongst politicians in the UK. We are getting closer and closer to a general election that's going to be very dominated by domestic issues, by people looking inwards. Um, there's a fear of the, the kind of populist agenda that's uh, that's, that's out there. Um, there's a lack of strategy on the left in the UK and in Europe for international relations and uh, what our role is in the world today, what, we're, what sort of world we're trying to help create and what, how do we play a part in that. Um, but these kind of discussions with this group of this kind of group of people could be happening all over the UK at the moment. And you would have as many people as this in the room and it would be energised and interesting and it could be going all night if we really got going here. We didn't have to make a presentation. We could probably keep going till midnight, uh, <laughs> and uh, and I would just like to see more of it. You know, let's 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 grab the debate back again, not leave it to those that want there to be a little England, a little, little Britain out on the fringes that's not part of the rest of the world. Um, let's grab it back from them, and let's energise future generations to be you know what we once were. And that and I mean I think if we do that, then I think we can turn the debate in the next three years. Um, if we sit back and let things go the way they're going, then, uh, then we're going to regret it. Thanks. I think if we're going on until midnight, we might have had to have kept the wine in this room. Um, <laughs> Francis? <coughs> well, first, I think it's exciting that Lawrence can now spend all his time thinking about these issues. <laughs> so I'm going to forward to that. It's like Tony Benn, right? Yes, <laughs> Living the House of Parliament. Well, one takeaway I have is that, you know, it's really an old-fashioned concept that we have an institution, or we all have institutions which just look at developing countries as they're a separate unit, and we shouldn't. We should be looking at problems, and we should be looking at the university. I think that's the main thing I would take away. I'd also say that we've also been very UK-centric in our discussions, which I guess is no surprise since we're in the UK. But it's not just here that people are turning away from globalization. It's not yeah. just here, it's yeah. all over the place. So this is a really a global issue and a global challenge that we have to counter the very parochialism of, of well, you, someone mentioned Europe. Yes, that Europe mm. used to be the, uh, the leader and, and it does sort of non-existent at the moment. So I think mm -hmm. it's something that we need to work with others across the world, the country, and not just mm. in the UK. Lawrence. Uh, thank you, James. I think um, I think I'd like to see. Uh, I think there's going to be a, there's going to come a time when we will have not a department for international development, but a department for global development. Mm -hmm. And I think the department for global development will have some aid specialists in it, will have some climate people in it, will have some governance people in it, will have some tax people in it. We'll have 
people from right across the spectrum. And I'm hoping there will be lots of these around the world. And these departments of global development will focus on global collective action issues. And they will also focus on common issues. They may not be, they may not require collective action to solve them, but they will be common. So there will be lots of cross-learning. And I think the, the thing that I'm really unclear about is how long that's going to take to happen. Because it seems to me that the pressure is building in two different directions. The pressure to come up with government and society, whole of society responses to collective action problems is building quite quickly. But also the pressure to narrow it down, put it in a box, and the value for money um, imperative says focus in these countries, focus on tangibles, focus on projects, focus on things that are easy to measure the impact of. And at some stage, those two things are going to collide, and something good is going to come out of it after something bad happening. And I just don't know. I don't know whether the bad can be avoided, and whether the uh, and how good the good will be, and I don't know how long it's going to take. But that, that's the kind of thing I take away from this. Okay, so thank you to our panel, Ben, Jack, Francis, and of course Lawrence. It's not over, do not leave, okay? You're just, you can just move down the corridor, and there's a place just to the right called the gallery room. IDS staff will show you the way, where our chair, Richard Manning, will be making a short presentation, and there is uh, food and wine and music. But thank you very much. Can I thank the change? Yes, thank you very much.